Hi, and welcome to uh, our Tinkercad Teachers webinar. Uh, so this is a webinar brought to you by Autodesk, uh, and I'm super happy to get started. Uh, this is Kellyanne Mahoney. I'm a Youth Program Specialist at Autodesk, and today for episode two, we're gonna be talking about how to use Tinkercad for project-based learning. And we're so happy you're all here. Okay, so how to participate. So you should see on your right side of your screen, screen there's a chat area, uh, and there are we have Autodesk experts who are ants who are able to answer your questions in real time. So if you have any questions as we're going along, uh, there are people out there who are there to help you. So um, feel supported. Also, if you fall behind at any time during this webinar, don't worry about it. It's being recorded. Uh, you can watch it again. Actually, in about a week or so, or maybe even shorter than that, you're going to receive an email with the link to the recording. Uh, so don't worry about it if you fall behind. So just to begin, so we're going to be talking about project-based learning in Tinkercad today. But for some of you who might be new to Tinkercad in general, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what Tinkercad is. So Tinkercad is a free web-based uh, 3D design program. Um, my, my daughter would actually say that it's for newbies, um, which I think is, <laughs> is a nice way to talk about it. Uh, but I would also make the argument that even uh, 3D design experts use Tinkercad for things like rapid prototyping. So you have an idea in your head, you want to bring it to reality really quickly. You can see how you can, when you open up Tinkercad, you've got your work plane, you've got your shapes, you can drag them out onto the work plane. Uh, you can make the shapes more intricate by doing things like smart duplicate, which you can see here, and also by turning the shapes into holes and making the, the shape really interesting. And then you also, once you finish, you can uh, send it to your 3D printer to print it. So uh, it's a really great way to take your ideas and bring them to, to reality really quickly. And we're going to show you more later. We'll do a Tinkercad demo. So what are we going to learn today? Lots of things. Uh, first off, how to design project-based learning units that leverage Tinkercad as a tool. So we're really going to be talking about how Tinkercad is a vehicle in order to uh, help you uh, rev up inquiry and innovation and um, engagement and fun, hopefully, uh, in your classroom. And also, we think of Tinkercad as a vehicle in order to make learning more accessible uh, for all people. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about universal design for learning today as well. Lots of more things. <laughs> Teachers love standards. We know that standards are really important and we really care about addressing all of the standards. So don't worry about it if you're thinking, how can I do fun interdisciplinary project-based things and also address the standards? We've got them covered today. Uh, we're going to talk about how to assess. So uh, most projects that you make um, can't be run through a Scantron machine. Uh, so it's not multiple choice. So how do, how do, we, uh, how do we see uh, what students learn and how, how are students going to be able to show what they learn through project-based like learning, we have that covered. Uh, we're also going to talk about, we don't want you to worry about it if you don't have a 3D printer. Uh, we're going to talk about ways to publish student work and for students to be able to express what they know uh, without using a 3D printer. So don't worry about it. And we also are going to talk about additional resources that you can use uh, for increasing your Tinkercad skills and also doing PBL. So our agenda for today, this makes it look very simple. Step one, uh, we're going to get rolling with Tinkercad. Uh, you're going to meet all the awesome teachers that are behind me. <laughs> so um, we're very cozy here at the Leslie Steam Learning Lab at Leslie University. Uh, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, we're going to have uh, some experts on project-based learning kind of frame uh, the discussion and also uh, so we'll get into high-level points about project-based learning and Tinkercad and why you would connect the two. And then we're all going to drill down deeper with some specific examples from real classrooms uh, as well. We'll talk about project ideas and also, really importantly, assessment. Step two. For step two, we're going to talk about how you can extend your students' work. So we'll uh, talk about making learning visible, and we're going to give you some tips in terms of uh, how you could use things like Minecraft or screen capturing in order to take students learning to a new level and for them to be able to express what they know. And finally, step three, turning the tables back at you. So uh, we'll do our quick Tinkercad demo. I'm going to show you how we made this playground here today and have you think about how you could do a project with your students in which they're designing a playground. Uh, we'll practice the moves. You guys will make something. 
And then also there'll be some time at the end to ask more questions. So who are we? Uh, so again, my name is Kelly Ann Mahoney. I'm a youth program specialist at Autodesk. I am also a national board certified teacher. I taught in the Boston Public Schools for 13 years. I do hold a master's degree in education. I'm sure many of you guys do as well. Uh, and I just actually started at Autodesk. I joined in July, so I was just fresh out of the classroom. So, and I miss it, um, but I love Tinkercad too. <laughs> uh, so, and, so who else is here? I'm so happy to be joined by such awesome, creative, uh, innovative, uh, beautiful <laughs> teachers and educators. Uh, this is our first time on film as well for this series, so we're working that out as well. So Sue is here. Sue is an educator. She's a maker. Uh, she is a fierce advocate for stu student-centered learning and also making learning accessible to all people. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Leslie University, where we are situated right now, and again, the Leslie Steen Learning Lab at Leslie University, and it's very cute here. Uh, we're happy to be here in this very creative space. Um, so that's Sue. JC is also here as well. JC is a former technology coordinator and a children's programs director. Um, she is passionate about creative computing and STEAM education. She loves to talk about it. Uh, and she's also, she's an assistant director here at uh, the Leslie STEAM Learning Lab. We are also joined by Matthew Birch. He is a grade six math teacher at the wonderful Kennedy School in Somerville, Massachusetts, which is very close to Leslie University in the beautiful <laughs> Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, he holds a master's degree in elementary STEM education from Tufts University. Uh, and he really cares about in his classroom working to embed mathematics within meaningful classroom projects. I know, for example, when I was an elementary school student, or even a middle school student and thinking about math, I always was wondering what's the story and what's the context um, and you know why am I learning this? And I wish I had it, a wonderful teacher like Matt. Um, also, Len, <laughs> Lindsay uh, Toskis, I got yes, Toskis. You got it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Lindsay is teaching me pronunciation. <laughs> so, uh, uh, wonderful uh, Lindsay. Toskis is a grade six STEAM teacher. She's also at the wonderful Kennedy School in Somerville, Massachusetts. Uh, she has a Master's of Arts in Elementary Education. She's also the Makerspace Coordinator at the JFK School, uh, and she really cares about working to bring creativity, problem, problem solving, and design thinking into the classroom. And I'm sure you're all here as well for the same reason, uh, so let's get started. I'm excited about it. So we're actually going to begin by talking about why PBL and Tinkercad, uh, and we're going to, and why would you combine the two? So uh, at this point, JC and Sue from Leslie Steen are going to uh, take over and talk about that. And I'm going to continue to control the slides. <laughs> so we wanted to start by providing some framework around our definition of project-based learning because there are a lot of different uh, ideas about what project-based learning is and isn't. Um, so we chose a quote by the Buck Institute for Education, uh, who is a national leader in developing assessments and frameworks and best practice models for teachers to use to meaningfully integrate project-based learning into their classroom. Uh, and the quote that we chose really summarizes how project-based learning isn't just a one-off in terms of doing hands-on learning, but it's really more of a sustained inquiry model. Um, so they, they talk about how project-based learning is a teaching method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex question, problem, or challenge. Um, and as you'll see it on, in the graphic on the right, can you flip back to that? Awesome. <laughs> the, um, the graphic on the right shows the gold standard project-based learning elements, and many of these you'll see in the projects that Matt and Lindsay are gonna share tonight. Um, specifically starting with an authentic learning challenge, um, um, student voice and student choice, um, providing adequate time for student reflection. And then what Tinkercad does uniquely is provides that uh, project at the end that students can share out with their peers or their community. So when thinking a little bit more about Tinkercad and PBL, um, the other aspect of this that is very exciting is that it affords unique access for kids. 
some learning contexts are simply not accessible for all the students in the classroom. And the structure of PBL affords unique and different points of entry for kids into the learning process. And uh, that parallels the discussion around universal design. And I'm hoping that I'm speaking to an audience that has is familiar with the Universal Design for Learning model. It's uh, offered through CAST, which um, is actually, we're fortunate to have them in Massachusetts, but their model is integrated into thinking and in policy across the country. Uh, there are three principles that underpin um, the universal design model, but the global tenant is that we should be designing curriculum and instruction in a way that addresses the needs of our students instead of asking our students to address the needs of the curriculum. And in that way, you've got um, their three principles sit on multiple modes of representation. So in this case, um, how can you represent your curriculum concepts in a different way or in multiple ways so that you might have a text-based presentation or you might have a, an image um, that carries the content. Or when we're talking about um, Tinkercad, you're actually moving into a, almost a multimodal situation where it's interactive, it's iterative. It creates opportunity to move into not just representation, but also the action and expression principle where the design process is iterative and dynamic and interactive. And then the other component is, is that we know painfully well that if students aren't engaged or motivated about the curriculum, they just kind of check out. And um, we have a lot of students in our schools that are checked out. And sometimes that presents itself um, in the form of um, behavior that's unwelcome. But it also um, would be perhaps inaccurate to assume that a well-behaved child is also fully plugged in. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, compliance does not reflect engagement. And so I think that there are aspects of project-based learning, and then you add a tool like Tinkercad, which can whose affordances can service project-based learning in a really smart way, um, you create opportunities that really meet all of the dimensions of universal design for learning. Um, so we just wanted to give a little bit of background in terms of how these folks um, came together. Um, so the Leslie Steam Learning Lab um, and Kennedy School began a partnership. We're actually in our third year of a partnership with them. And it really began with um, the entire school community being interested in creating more capacity for hands-on, um, more STEM, STEAM-based learning in their curriculum. Um, and so that first year, Leslie Steam helped the school launch the Makerspace and Innovation Lab at the school. And then it moved into a coaching model where we work with teachers at grade level meetings, um, common planning time meetings, to meet them at their comfort level and really help them co-develop uh, lessons and units that were more inquiry-based, more student-centered. Um, and what we found was that at this point, the schools really just took off running and in all grade levels across all content areas, um, not just science and not just math, but um, across the board, um, teachers are really interested in engaging their students with more hands-on project-based learning. Great, so now we're gonna move on to uh, Tinkercad and project-based learning at the Kennedy School. Uh, so the, we've got this high-level sort of overview about why project-based learning and why Tinkercad and how it makes learning more accessible and more engaging and even more rigorous, I would argue, as well, and I'm sure you guys would, too. Um, but now we're going to kind of get really deep into the classroom level with some specific project ideas, examples, student work, and insights. Uh, and also, uh, Lindsay and Matt are going to talk about assessment as well. So I'm going to hand the mic over to Lindsay. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Toskis, and I am going to talk to you today about an end of the year project that I've done with students for the past few years called Watervention. This is something that's based on the new science standards, primarily around the human impact standard. Um, most of the grade levels have something like this, um, and it's a really great connection for kids to really get them engaged and involved in problems that are real 
to them and to people they may know. Um, this project um, focused on access to clean water. So who has access and what do people do when they don't have access to clean water? The slide that you're looking at is really what I frame my classroom around, and that is the engineering and design process. So you can see here the steps. Um, students have to define a problem and make a claim. They spend a lot of time doing background research. I do um, sometimes preload this for students, and I've used things like Taggle and Word Clouds that are linked to websites to sort of make the search process easier for them. Um, they definitely need that help. <laughs> um, and then taking them through brainstorming solutions and thinking about constraints. So what do they think will work? What materials do we have? And can we make this um, in the way that we want to? And the building a prototype is where Tinkercad comes into this discussion. Students were building a water filter based on what would fit into a single-use plastic water bottle. And we have some. <laughs> These are just <laughs> rocks. <laughs> um, so they had to do the calculations for math, doing circumference, figuring out will it fit, um, what other materials will they have, testing it out. Um, we do have a 3D printer in our maker space, so the students were able to print um, with different fills to filter out different size particles, and you'll see that in just a minute. Um, and then it comes to probably my most favorite part of design thinking in the classroom, and that's when students get to iterate their design or redesign, figure out what's not working and how they can make it better. I always tell my students that this is where the magic happens <laughs> because they either get frustrated and want to give up, or they really come together to make it happen because they want to succeed. And I think this is the most fun part. It can be the most successful, and um, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes this gets a little bit messy, but when you have kids all working together and supporting each other, it can still be a really successful um, process for them. And then as part of project-based learning, a big part of that is students presenting and having an authentic audience for their work. So for this case, they had to um, present to parents and to other members of our school, younger grades, upper grades, and it turned out to be a pretty fun and exciting project. These are some of their critical questions. Um, who doesn't have access to clean water? What are water filters? They don't have to thankfully think about them where we live. Um, what materials can be used to create water filters? And if people don't have access to water, um, what other options do they have? Well, can you just go back for one second? You can see um, the math calculations in connection to Tinkercad. So figuring out the circumference and using the ruler on Tinkercad, they were able to get the exact measurements for what they needed. Um, here you can see the different fills. So um, making just a simple disk and either having it filled in almost solidly, or you can see on the JJ30 um, that the holes were much bigger, so you can actually see through that. And they were put into the water filter that you were about to see. Right, so we are about to play a video, uh, and we're hoping that you guys will be able to see it. <laughs> How did it taste? Uh, <laughs> oh, we did. <laughs> okay, it's so good. We wanted to watch it again. <laughs> we, we did talk about the water not being potable at that at that point in the process. Um, <laughs> I do just want to mention um, students had a, roles that they could choose from from this project. So not every student is in, interested in the actual design of something. So. Um, those who did choose this design, they were the inventors for the project, while other students did more researched, um, inquiry-based parts of it. Um, and the big question is, how do you assess um, this type of learning in the classroom? So you can see some of the questions that the students had um, to answer. 
what they had to show um, towards the end. But for me, a big part of project-based learning assessment is can the students explain what they've done? Can they explain it to me as their teacher? And can they explain it to other people um, in a way that they are teaching them about what they've done? They can explain their whole process to them. And also, if you have an audience of different ages coming in, can the students adapt what they're saying in order to meet the needs of the people who are listening to them? It's a really hard thing, I think, for students to think of off the cuff, but definitely something as a teacher to you know, make them aware of. If you've got a kindergartner coming in, probably not going to use the same vocabulary that you would use in the sixth grade. So how can you adapt um, what you know to make it accessible to anyone who's coming to see you? And this is actually the rubric that you use. This is part of the this. rubric. And um, when you guys get this link, you can see the full rubric for the project um, by clicking on that link. And it's super cool how both Lindsay and Matt also jigsaw their project so that everybody has different roles. And that's reflected in the rubric, too. So mm -hmm. I'm really glad that Lindsay included that. All right, so next we're going to hear from Matt. Uh, and he's going to talk about his earthquake-resistant building project. And I think that there is a video in store as well. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to give it away. Uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, my name is Matt Birch. I'm a, now I'm just a math teacher at uh, the Kennedy School. But in previous years, I taught math and science. Um, so this project that I'm about to speak to was um, our earthquake resistant building project and it came at the end of our unit on um, plate tectonics and earth science and at the beginning of our engineering design uh, unit. And as a math teacher and um, as was mentioned at the start, one of the things that is near and dear to my heart is how can we embed mathematics into, into meaningful projects, um, be that science or any other type of project that actually allow students to engage with mathematics in a way that could be reflected in what they would see in a real world uh, sense. Um, so you can see on the slide that you're looking at now, this um, kind of flow chart um, mirrors both the engineering design process that Lindsay spoke to earlier and the different steps of um, this earthquake resistant building um, structure that students were uh, tasked with creating. Um, so it really began with students um, using Tinkercad as a tool to, to brainstorm their solutions. Um, from there, students took their, their initial ideas and, and came into a group together to try and um, debate and discuss which of their initial designs or what combination of their designs um, would best survive an earthquake. And they also had to take into consideration some of the constraints that I had placed upon them. So um, specifically, it was required to be a certain height, um, had to incorporate a certain base area, and um, when they actually came to start building these out of popsicle sticks and, and hot glue guns, um, they were, each of those materials was assigned a certain price. Um, so they had to keep track of their budget, make an estimate about what kinds of materials they would need and how much materials they could afford. And from there, after they had started prototyping and trying to put these ideas all together, um, students broke it off and started picking out their particular roles. Um, so for example, the chief designer was the one really responsible for, again, going into Tinkercad and trying to merge different ideas that students had into what would become really the model for the, the tower, the building that they would create. Um, so after that, once the, the Tinkercad design was ready, once our estimates were in, um, students bought their materials and began to build um, with the ultimate goal that they were hoping that their building would survive a 30 second ride on the on the shape table, um, which we'll see on the, the next slide. <laughs> um, so before we uh, watch this video, I think it's, again, really important to, to come back to, to thinking about how, despite the craziness of the video that you're about to see, that um, students are still really engaging with um, you know, high level standards and engaging with them in meaningful ways. Um, so as I mentioned, these design uh, process standards, working with constraints, um, going through multiple steps of the design um, and multiple versions of the design to come up with the best structure possible. And all that's, as I mentioned, embedded within uh, the math standards as well, um, keeping back of the budget. Um, as you can see, those two math standards that um, students continue to have to wrestle with throughout the project was um, all those operations with decimals that um, require them to, to keep track of that budget, as well as um, making sure that they're building met the requirements of, of the base area. So let's take a look at this video. You're in store for a treat. <laughs> If 
So as you can think, this is my, uh, my best efforts to destroy that building. Um, the, the end product for these particular students was a successful, successful test. Um, and what I wanted to really come out of this project, however, was not just a, a simple, fun um, shaking of a popsicle stick building at the end. Um, students really came out of this project with multiple different artifacts um, that spoke to their progress around these math and science standards. Um, so I was asking students to not only test their buildings, but um, show the progression of their designs. So they took screenshots of their Tinkercad designs and models and what the, their building actually ended up looking like, as well as submitting um, their math calculations, their final budget, and ending the project with writing a persuasive letter as if they were an engineering uh, design company um, trying to convince uh, a city manager that their building was the best and safest uh, for, their, for their city. And so all in all, it was a, a combination of a engaging but still very challenging task that asked students to, to truly um, engage and uh, wrestle with the complexity of these math and science things. Yay, Yay rubrics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the project is over, but is it really over? Uh, have students been able to share what they learned with each other? Uh, and how can you take their projects to the next level? as well. Uh, so the, our next step is to talk about how you can extend your students' work and really make it visible. Uh, so Sue is going to talk about one way that does not require a 3D printer at all. Uh, so do you want to talk about Minecraft a little? Sure. Um, it's just a small sign, sound bite, but you can actually take a file from Tinkercad and export it into Minecraft. So Minecraft has a fairly popular draw with kids. But uh, Minecraft also has a creative space, which gives you a blank canvas so that they can bring bring their earthquake buildings in, <laughs> and you can create a whole village um, of their of their artifacts. But it's possible to do uh, to approach it in a lot of different ways and use that as a new canvas that kids can interact with. So that is Minecraft. Um, so also another way that I just wanted to show you is through screen captures. Uh, so, and you'll actually see in our video, in our slides today, that little animated GIFs that I made, I actually did it through screen capturing. So, if you go into your Tinkercad gallery, so like the playground, for example, that you saw uh, in some of the posts about this webinar and also the car, uh, all I did was just go into um, my gallery or uh, the general Tinkercad gallery, which I'll show you later, and I just clicked on it. I went into view in 3D. And then if your students already have a design in 3D and you want them to be able to show it off, one way to do it is just to make a quick video. So I would be here. And then I would use quick, I use QuickTime. Uh, QuickTime is just a, a player, a video uh, recorder and player that's uh, free that's on Mac, but I'm sure there's other ways that you can do it as well. Um, and when you go into QuickTime, sorry, you right click on it. And you can actually go to new screen recording and click that. And then you, if you start the recording, it'll allow you to crop the, uh, the space. And then you can just start animating and moving your, your object around. And that's just another way that students could actually be able to show what they learn. So if maybe they have some sort of like website that they're collecting their work in like an online portfolio, or if um, maybe they just want to share the, a video of what they did with their families at home, this is one way of doing it. So I wanted to show you that. And we're going to get back to Tinkercad and uh, talk about the playground project in a moment as well. I'm going to close that. Uh, other resources. So again, uh, within the next week or so, uh, you're going to be getting an email with not only this, the link to this video and uh, this slideshow presentation, but other resources as well. So did you want to talk a little bit about some of the resources that you might be getting from us? We can share out a few flyer challenges that we've created. So we have a few inquiry-based Tinkercad challenges. Um, one that focuses on creating a city uh, using geometry skills. 
um, and one that also focuses on creating public art pieces um, and potentially you could build in like a historical monument um, piece to that as well. So we can share those out as PDFs. Yep, so there's little mini design challenges that you could maybe do in a day or two in class or some of the longer projects as well. I know that Lindsay, you had expressed that you wanted to share some of the unit, right? Right, um, for the water mm -hmm. filter, yep. yep. Um, so you can get the rubric, which is already will, will be attached to it, and also some resources on maybe the Taggle um, so that you can see how I've created, reloaded um, search engine, uh, created a search engine for the students so that they don't have to just go into the void of Google. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, so just wanted to remind you also, so did you have? No, I was just going to say it's an elegant curation strategy. <laughs> Um, I also just wanted to make you aware of other uh, resources uh, that are uh, Autodesk tools um, that, uh, in addition to Tinkercad, there's also Fusion 360. Uh, Fusion 360 is for when your kids are, when your students are maybe mastering some of the more finer elements of Tinkercad and are ready to take their designs to the next level. The cool thing that I like about using both Tinkercad and Fusion 360 is whatever designs that they make in Tinkercad, they could then, like imagine they made a car in Tinkercad, they could then import the STL file into Fusion 360 and maybe start playing around uh, in a sculpting environment in order to make the car have more organic shapes. So there's also um, more uh, complex math complex con concepts that you can teach through using Fusion 360. Uh, so it's nice uh, to use them together as well when you feel like your students are ready. Instructables. Instructables is uh, one of the largest, uh, I think it is the world's largest DIY uh, website for you to be able to find instructions for making things like how to bake the best chocolate chip cookies or how to do leather work uh, or how to uh, build a, a lamp or how to, uh, how to teach students how to integrate math into project-based learning using Tinkercad because we also have a Tinkercad uh, education channel as well on Instructable. So that's a great place not only for teachers to check out, but also if your students are really getting into making, uh, it's a cool resource to introduce to them uh, so that they can even do projects on their own as well. Design Academy uh, is kind of similar to moving from Tinkercad to Fusion 360. Design Academy also uh, is a, a learning platform that uh, students can use in order to hone their their design skills uh, in a more professional way. It's I mean it's it's directed at a college or professional audience, but it, it's also a great place for uh, your students to be able to see where they're going uh, with their work. Uh, so Design Academy is also a great resource as well. So just moving on. So if you are using this webinar. For your evaluation, uh, we wanted to think about, so we talked about how your students can make learning visual uh, visible and also how your students can extend their learning. And we wanted to think about how through this webinar, how you could also make your learning visible and extend your learning. Uh, so some ideas that we have for artifacts, uh, you could create a project or a unit plan that integrates Tinkercad with core content standards. So uh, we're gonna send you some examples of that as well, um, but that's something that maybe you could adapt or you could create something new based on these examples. Uh, another resource that I'm going to be sending you is I have a Tinkercad lesson plan template that also has uh, an additional um, extension to it that helps you adapt your lessons in order to, uh, to make sure that your lessons are accessible using uh, universal uh, design for learning principles. So that might be another artifact that you create as a Tinkercad lesson plan that takes into account. The, uh, the variety of learners, learners that you have in your classroom. Also, I'm very excited to let you know that we do have a certificate that is uh, debuting with this episode, uh, and you will be receiving this certificate um, for uh, watching this webinar. So if you're still here with us, you're gonna be getting this, uh, this beautiful certificate uh, in uh, your email. And also, it's, it, is saying, it says that you've completed two hours of professional development. This webinar will be probably close to an hour. We said 45 minutes, sorry. <laughs> but so you've, you've, uh, you've participated in this webinar, you've asked questions, you've followed along with us. And then also if you do this follow-up work, uh, that would equate to about probably more than two hours of professional development. Uh, so uh, check your email for this certificate. 
right, so next step is I wanted to show you, so I came up with this idea for the, uh, the playground project to show it from Leslie's team, um, because they had actually done this project with uh, the Kennedy School in Somerville as well. Uh, so I just wanted to bring you into uh, Tinkercad. So right now would be a time to follow along. So uh, go to tinkercad.com, or you can watch, but if you want to follow along, go to Tinkercad. I'm going to move the screen so you can see it. All right, so this is my gallery in Tinkercad. So this is actually, you've seen in some of the slides, this playground that I made. And how I actually made this was I went into the Tinkercad gallery and I was just looking at some designs. Um, if you search in the Tinkercad gallery, so again, I was in the Tinkercad gallery. If you search Tinkercad blocks, you'll find this design here. Uh, and this is, was actually made by John Halfin, who is a very brilliant and creative Autodesk employee. Um, and I thought, so sometimes I'm thinking about when you're working with students, for some students, they maybe want the, the clean slate of just the, the blank work plane, but maybe for other students, they might want to start uh, with a, a design that's in place and modify it and adapt it and make it their own. And when you think about design, you know, design, uh, you know, when you're designing a chair, you're not inventing a chair, you're designing something new uh, to fit the needs of whoever your user is. Uh, so I'm going to do copy and tinker. And you can do that too. And at the Kennedy School, the students actually thought about how not just the playground that they were designing, um, what, what they wanted in it and how it was going to be accessible to, to all students, but also they actually went out and looked at their, their own playgrounds and thought about not just the object itself that they were designing, but the space in which it was inhabiting. So I thought that was super cool. All right, so you'll see here that uh, this is John's design. Uh, but I'm going to make it my own. And one way you can do this is he's got these grouped together. So I might decide in my design, I don't want this object here. So I'm just going to click on it, select it, and I'm going to hit delete, and it's going to go away. Uh, so that's how I started moving stuff around. I might take this object here, and you can see, I'm going to scroll out a little bit. You can see how I can rotate it. So maybe I want it this way, and I'm going to change my snap grid which is in the lower right hand corner so that things move faster. So I changed it to five, so it moves five millimeters. And again, uh, Matt and Lindsay talked about how you can teach measurement through Tinkercad. It's a great, uh, great way to do that. Uh, I might take, might take this guy actually and move him over here and click on this and I'm gonna rotate it. So again, when I'm rotating, I'm just pulling on the little arrows that come out uh, and then I'm also, to make it move fast, you use the inside of the circle to make it move slower, use the, the outside. So I'm going to move that over here. So you can see that I'm starting to really make the design my own. I might lift this and scroll over. And you don't have to follow what I'm doing. You can make it your own. So I'm going to rotate this over. I'm going to move it over here. I might drop it down a little bit. So I'm dropping it by using that arrow that comes up at the top. And then maybe if I wanted to center it, I'm going to shift click here and select both. And you can see up here there's an align tool that can help me center things. If it's too big, I can make it smaller. So I could make it smaller by holding down shift and pulling uh, or pushing on these little handles here. Uh, so one thing that I ho I'm hoping that you're noticing as I'm uh, using Tinkercad is a lot of the commands that you use in Tinkercad are not very diff uh, different than if you're using PowerPoint, for example, and you're like editing a slide and making a picture bigger. Uh, so it's really that easy to use uh, through the power of the internet. I'm going to go back to my Tinkercad gallery and just show you uh, this design a little bit further advanced. So here, so this is after I was working on it for a little while, so you can see the changes that I made. 
Um, so you can see like this part here, I had extended out so you can extend things as well. So if you're still playing around, that's a fun one. Um, so I'm gonna show you how I actually put the slide here so you'll see the swings that I made. Um, so in the right-hand side under, you'll see basic shapes and those are just your cube or your pyramid. I'm gonna go to featured shape generators. And this is where you find the funkier looking uh, shapes. Uh, and I'm gonna grab the extruded curve. That's what I use to make the slide. So I'm just dragging that out on my work plane. It's always fun to see what color it comes out to. <laughs> I'm gonna click shift to make it bigger. The reason why I'm clicking shift when I drag out the, uh, the handles is so that it maintains the same proportions. It just gets bigger so it doesn't get all weird and skinny. So I'm gonna, oops, I just moved that. You know what's cool about Tinkercad 2 is control Z. If you mess up, it's easy to fix it. <laughs> So I'm gonna sh move this over this way. Camera controls are also important as well in Tinkercad. I'm gonna flip the slide over this way. Actually it goes this way. So here we go. Moving it over this way. And now it's looking more like a slide. I'm just gonna Okay, and then moving it back. Magic. And then moving it up a little bit. And then if I wanted to tilt it more, I can tilt it this way. It's a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> and then to change the color, so if you don't want it to be pink, you can change the color that way, it's that easy. Uh, and then also, just the cool thing about some of the featured uh, shapes and also the um, community shape generators, which are uh, made by our uh, community of Tinkercad uh, enthusiasts. Uh, they, a lot of the funkier shapes have cool uh, parameters that you can play around with. So if I wanted to change the curve on my slide, I can do this just by pulling the handles. That doesn't look like. <laughs> Could be a safety issue. Um, so I can change my curve that way. I can change the length of it. So, all right. All right. So, so you guys get it. <laughs> so Tinkercad is a very dynamic learning environment uh, for students. So I just wanted to show you that. And also uh, in the slideshow, you will see that the um, there's a link to this file as well. So. Uh, I think it's worth saying Matt and I both teach um, upper elementary, lower middle school, but this is definitely accessible to lower elementary students as well, especially those students that are really into video games. They pick up on this faster than um, I do. I usually can't watch them do it because they move so fast, but um, it's definitely accessible for lower grades too. And high school students can do really complex. Right, yeah. Like I've seen cool like theater design projects that are incorporating algebra as well. So. Um, Tinkercad is fun for all ages. <laughs> so our next steps so are we're going to talk about, we're going to uh, be answering questions. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to show you how we can continue to stay connected if you have questions after this episode is over. Um, so there's some links at the end of the slideshow, but uh, there's the Tinkercad forum is a place where you can ask questions as well as the Tinkercad Help Center. We are also on Facebook. So there's a Tinkercad Facebook page uh, and also Twitter. So there's all different ways so that we can uh, stay connected and stay in touch and for you to connect with other like-minded educators. Um, at this point, I would like to introduce Kayla, uh, who is one of our technical support people who is out in sunny San Francisco right now. Uh, and she has been, she and I believe Sarah O'Rourke is out there too. Uh, and I want to thank them both. So Sarah is a Tinkercad pro on the Tinkercad team. Uh, and uh, Kayla have been dutifully answering your questions as we've been talking and designing and making and uh, laughing. <laughs> so um, Kayla also, I want to warn you, has a voice that sounds very similar to my voice. So she's going to be asking questions to us, but I want to assure you that we're not the same person. <laughs> um, so she's she's found some really interesting questions. Uh, so Kayla, what do you have for us? Thanks, Kellyanne. Um, so the first question I have is, what is the best project that students have enjoyed modeling than 3D printing or top project that is very popular to 3D printing? 3D prints, rather. Um, so I can speak to, to one project that 
been very popular with my students is uh, an entrepreneur or Shark Tank project um, where they're ultimately um, creating a business or creating a product. Um, and a number of students, they have a lot of options in how they create that final product. Um, but a lot of students do like to use Tinkercad and then ultimately 3D print um, their designs. Um, so that's been everything from a you know a more simpler um, way to keep your shoes tied without ever actually having to untie or uh, untie or retie them. Um, and <laughs> gone to uh, <laughs> students who. Um, try to make their, their classroom lives more efficient. So those students who always are, are losing pencils came up with um, new tools to attach those to their binders, uh, desks, themselves, whatever really <laughs> worked. Um, and those had varying degrees of success. But um, the, the tinker, uh, Tinkercad and then 3D printing was a great option for them. Even if they weren't 3D printing, it was still, again, a great way for them to visualize or uh, make clear to their audience what their, their idea for a project. Uh, final product actually. And, um, for my students, I think getting to print some of the playground equipment that we did, they actually had to make a model of what they wanted their playground to look like. So they were printing garden beds and um, outdoor classroom seating and tire swings. And it's very exciting when the 3D printer gets going and they get to actually take the tangible object that they designed and put it into a model. So, yeah, so we worked with a teacher um, who was working with first and second graders, uh, and they read the, uh, the Big Orange Squat, I believe is the name of the books. Um, and it's all about um, you're basically creating your dream home. So, she worked with students to have them sketch out their dream home um, and then um, prototype it using Tinkercad and then ultimately print it out. Tinkercad as well. And they actually used a white filament that they then painted in with actual paint once it was 3D printed. And um, it's just another layer of uh, letting the students really make it their own unique piece. This is making me want to go back to elementary. And <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Kayla? Yes. Um, could you give us some examples of student roles in the Water Invention Project? Um, sure. So students could really choose how they wanted to approach this project. Um, they could choose to be a local journalist who is researching uh, the water for the city, where we get our water from, the quality of our water, um, our reservoirs, so really digging deep into some research and also contacting people from the city of Somerville's uh, water department to really get an expert um, opinion on this. They could be a global reporter. So reporting and re well, researching and reporting on areas around the globe where clean water is um, a problem. They could be the inventor. They could also be um, the scientist. And in that role, they just did research on how much of all the water on the planet is actually drinkable. And there's a great experiment out there called Drop in the Bucket, which makes this um, really hit home for the students just how little um, is actually available for drinking. And then there was also the cho choice role. So if they really weren't into all of those choices, but they had an idea for something else that was related to it, they could go ahead with that. Um, I had one group that did a desalination um, project and experiment and designed a very simple um, crock pot desalinator. <laughs> um, but those were the, the main roles that I gave them their choice on. And they could give me their top three options and then most of the kids got what they wanted and you know you get what you get and you don't get upset <laughs> usually with your top three no i um, don't want to go back to <laughs> um but usually everybody was pretty happy with what they got <laughs> anything else kayla yes we have a lot of questions hold on there are like a thousand people here i think we we're so excited about how many people <laughs> registered for this and i think it speaks to the quality of the teachers that we have <laughs> with us today um is there any model or project of how to make uh, the air purifier um, there maybe <laughs> <laughs> Um, I focus mainly on the water filter design, but um, you could, I think, use the same model for um, filtering air. 
having students research what else they could put into it. And <laughs> uh, another question: Do you have students change roles if you notice they tend to select similar style roles each time? Um, I think the in terms of uh, different projects I've done, I think the the roles have shift enough with the projects that uh, students, you know, through choice, they they might, you know, have a tendency to, to want to be the one that plays with Tinkercad a lot. Um, but in general, I, I feel like the, again, the roles change depending on the project that they're doing. And I generally think it's, it's a positive thing for, for students to go to their strengths and, and feel, feel proud of that and be able to engage in a project and, in a role that they feel confident with. Mm -hmm. And I think usually in the classrooms that I try to create, the students want the ones that are really good at Tinkercad or are really good at doing research to sort of take the lead and help to guide the group as they move through the activity. So creating that sort of um, peer relationship and peer collaboration model in the classroom, I think, takes away from kids just always going to the same thing without accountability for any of the other pieces. But. Other questions, Kayla? Yes. How could one utilize Tinkercad to collaborate with a buddy classroom from another state or country? Hmm. I think there are lots of um, lots of options. Sue mentioned something earlier, and something that's really stuck with me this year is not asking students um, what they want to be when they grow up, but what problems do they want to solve. So, you know, connecting with a buddy classroom about a local problem. Um, that maybe one of the classrooms is having and then having all the students collaborate on ideas to solve the problem is maybe one really great way. Um, yeah. And it could go both ways because if you are communicating across the world in different countries and the problems that you're facing are most likely not the same. So, And also Tinkercad has a collaborate feature within it as well. So that would be really cool to think about how students could collaborate on the same mm -hmm. design from other parts of the world. So I know with the earthquake resistant building project, students were able to use that library function so that they were shifting, merging, using each other's ideas and trying to put them all together into one, one design. Obviously, that was happening within just my classroom. Um, but the same ideas and principles could be you know, extrapolated out to uh, farther spread out objects. These questions have um, us thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kayla, you were Yeah, well, maybe do one or Two more questions here and then wrap up. Um, can you speak more to sample projects for K through K through two rather? Um, I actually saw one, I can't remember the person's name on Instagram, but it was um, first graders doing modeling snowflakes as a winter project. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, Instagram person, I can't remember your name. <laughs> but it looked really great and it seemed like it was a real success, but I think our Geometry City project would really speak to that age level too, um, because especially if you have a mouse, that that's critical, um, in particular for younger students to access all the, you know, the, the ways to move around Tinkercad screen. Um, but just the idea that you could use Tinkercad as a playground to play with shapes and size and proportion um, and um, helping students visualize a plane. So, um, something really interesting for art teachers to consider with that age level as well in terms of line and color and shape and perspective. Um, there's a lot of visual uh, literacy skills that are can be accessed through just playing with it um, in that sense as well. So we will be sharing out our Geometry City uh, challenge and that would be a great project to work with the younger students. It would be cool too with that project to think about designing it in Tinkercad first and then designing it in, you know, with paper and mm -hmm. um, craft supplies as well or doing vice versa. Yeah, I've heard of other educators doing quite a bit of math things like building their own tanagrams and other projects. And we just had a user comment too that they're doing a braille project with first graders where they're using text to braille translator and creating signs for their school. That's, That's, so, That's so cool. Great. And um, a lot of people are asking about collaborating on Tinkercad, Kellyanne, I think is probably our last question. There's a lot of comments on that with between students. So do you want to see how you would do that? Or is it the question? Yeah. About, okay, let's see if we can yeah. get into. I'm just gonna go back to this slide. 
Oops, there we are. All right, so in Flickr CAD, sorry, it's going to move my window over. Okay, there we are. Okay, you can see Flickr CAD. So if I were to uh, go into, there's my dinosaur necklace design. <laughs> so I'm inside one of my designs right now. So this is the dinosaur necklace, and yeah. Um, so I, uh, I just you saw that I just clicked here. Sorry, it was the little. So here's me, and then the, you see this little icon of a person with a plus sign next to it. If I click on that, uh, it says collaborate. So uh, first time sharing this design or your previously shared links have expired. So click below to create a new one. So I'm going to generate this new link. I'd copy this link, and then I would just share that link uh, with another student, and they'd be able to, to access it, and we could design it together in real time. Did you guys have Great. anything to add to that? Because you've done that with students yeah, before. Yeah, I do the same way, and they could share it um, on a Google Doc or just whatever link they mm -hmm. could come on. Is there a limit to how many kids can collaborate at the same time? Have you run into that? I had up to four students, so as far as I know, at least four can. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Size team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other questions, Kayla? Let's do one last question. Sorry. Uh, how do you introduce um, Tinkercad to your students? Is it best to demo a lesson or any tips on getting started initially? I think for me, I always have it. We do have a smart board in our classroom, so I'll bring it up on the smart board and just sort of walk them through the steps of logging in and getting to where they can create their own design. But then I definitely allow time for them to just play around with the different features. You know, there's things I want them to have on there, like the ruler, um, maybe a few other things, but just letting them play around with it and explore and really explore making their own designs at first, just so they can get used to manipulating um, the screen. We also find students who um, take to it very quickly and are able to develop um, a lot of skills um, that even I couldn't come up with. Um, my first couple of times with it <laughs> and it's uh, also great to allow those students to take more active role in helping other students out i think Lindsay has like a technology expert or yeah we just identify those um student tech leaders in your classroom really quickly it's going to save you as the teacher for sure um the kids can field questions there's more of them and only one of you usually so let them take that role and have them not take over for the other kids, but walk them through it. And I was yeah. trying to show it. So on the uh, Tinkercad, uh, when you're just at the landing page at the top, uh, there is a tab where you can go to learn. And there's actually six lessons that are really quick. They take about two minutes or three minutes to do them. And it teaches you just the, the simple first moves that you need uh, in order to get started. So that's a great place as well is just to, you know, you have the project in mind that students are working on, but give them like a class period to just play around with it and see what they can do. Just mm -hmm. reinforce that peer-to-peer um, -peer support is, is a real value-added move to make. And um, it makes kids feel better. Oftentimes, you'll have a student that um, gets to re-introduce um, themselves to their peers because they have that strength. Um, they may not have the strength um, in other more traditional academic contexts, that they excel in these types of hands-on or uh, digital making approaches. And it really lets them assert a different identity to their peers. And uh, I want to reinforce for Lindsay that it can be very overwhelming to have a lot of kids working on um, a technology-based project. Um, stuff happens with technology all the time. And uh, it's really important to know that Functionally, the room knows more than any one person, so leverage those resources, <laughs> and um, it's a really wonderful community building opportunity as well. Any last questions, Kayla? I think we should wrap, time to wrap up. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, um, we'll keep stay connected. Uh, maybe we can, we can use our peer-to-peer -peer network to ask questions as well uh, yeah. via the Tinkercad Facebook page or Twitter. And um, we also have on um, our profile slides, you can get 
um, in touch with us and see what's happening at the Kennedy School through our website and our um, Instagram page. You can see what's been happening uh, across grade levels at our school. I'm happy to field questions or. Yeah, that's on Lindsay's uh, bio slide. There's a link to the, the STEAM lab there as well. Yeah. It's kennedyschool.com and Kennedy uh, School Makerspace.com and Instagram is just Kennedy Makerspace. Okay, so thank you all for joining with us. Uh, we're going to be uh, announcing what we're going to do for episode three pretty soon. So we hope to see you guys again as well. Uh, but for now, we're going to stop showing our screen and say goodbye. Um, but thank you so much for joining. Do we want to do the wave? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. That's <laughs>